Hello friends, it is almost time for middle grade March and as a children's bookseller with a particular interest in middle grade, you know I'm excited. So today I want to go through the prompts for middle grade March this year, give you some recommendations, books that I've already read that I think you'll like too. And then while we're going, I'm also going to tell you about the books that I plan to read to meet those prompts myself. If by chance you haven't heard of middle grade March before, I'll leave some details in the description box below for you. But basically it was a readathon started by Krista over at Books and Jams a few years ago, like five or six years ago. And it's just a fun community event where we're are encouraged to read middle grade and this year we have five prompts to help us pick what to read and the very first prompt is to read a book with a one word title and I have two Australian middle grade books that I would love to recommend if you are looking for a one word title book to read in March the first is Bindi this is by Curly Saunders and this is just such a beautiful middle grade book and it's actually all told in verse and we do also get some really beautiful illustrations throughout too in this book we follow 11 year old Bindi she's an Aboriginal girl living on Gundungara country and and we essentially just follow her for one year in her life and we get to be with her as she experiences some of those high highs associated to the things that she loves while also watching and being with her during some of the more challenging times throughout the year too. For example she breaks her wrist at one point and then there's also a drought and bushfires in the area too. Bindi's just such a wonderful character to follow and the way that it's written in verse and it includes Gundangara language too. I just thought it was so well done. It's so beautiful. I love the little illustrations throughout too. Bindi's such a wonderful character to follow. She's one of those characters that I have remembered years after having first read this book and she really grounds the whole story which is ultimately in so many ways about community about land about caring for the land about climate change this little book captures a really big year for Bindi and it's just beautiful another Australian middle grade with a one word title is Wandy by Favel Perret this is a fictionalization of a true story about a true dingo an actual dingo that you can follow on Instagram dingoes are the apex predator here in Australia they're hugely intelligent and Wandy is an alpine dingo who were long thought to be extinct. But when Wandi was discovered alone as a pup, people started to realize that alpine dingoes are still alive and thriving in some areas of Australia. And they're very important to those ecosystems. So this is basically a fictionalization of his story right from when he was born and living with his family to maybe how he got separated and then ended up in human care. It's a very easy to read kind of book, although it does have its sadder moments, but you'll fall in love with Wandi. And basically the book's aim is to make you fall in love with and care about dingoes and their place in our ecosystems just as much as we care about koalas and kangaroos. As the apex predator in Australia during the early days especially of colonization dingoes would often hunt and kill sheep and cattle of the white settlers which resulted in culling of dingoes but also in the all-round general really negative perception Australian society often has of dingoes and so this book is seeking to challenge that and to remind us of how intelligent beautiful incredible dingoes are and also how important they are and we get to do that by falling in love with one dingo in particular it's just a beautiful book as for me and the one word title book that I'm hoping to get to in March I picked up recently Thunderbird by Sonia Nimra and it's translated by M. X. Qualey. Sonia is a Palestinian author and I recently read one of her adult works. It's called Wondrous Journeys in Strange Lands. I loved it. It ended up as one of my honorable mentions of favorites last year. And so I was thrilled to discover that she has written a middle grade series. This is kind of like part one. I think there's two or three books and apparently it's a fast paced time traveling fantasy adventure centered on Noor, a young orphan Palestinian girl who starts in the present and must go back in time to get four magical bird feathers to save the world. It's only about a hundred pages so I feel like I can definitely get to this and I'm really looking forward to it. Next up we have the debut books but I'm also kind of mixing this up with another prompt which is books that you missed. So the debut books that I feel like you probably haven't heard of and I think you should give them a try. Firstly we have Wheeler the Koori Warrior by Jordan Gould and Richard Pritchard. This is the first book in what is going to become a series. The second book has just come out and it's an historical fantasy adventure story set here in what is now called Australia millennia ago. We meet Wheeler just as her family and her clan are being attacked by dragons and as her grandmother is dying after this attack she tells Wheeler that it is her job to become the Kuri warrior and save her people and so she sets off on this big adventure and during the book we get so many glimpses and education moments about Indigenous Australia. At the back there's even a glossary and pronunciation guide for some of the words that you'll discover throughout the book. Wheeler is such an amazing character she's courageous she's kind but she's not perfect and so we get to see quite a lot of character development even already in this first book. There's a bit of humor there's plenty of heart and also there's megafauna creatures that we get to meet as well it's just so cool. The next book is The Winterish Girl and this is a high 
fantasy, sprawling adventure with incredible world building. This was Melody's middle grade debut. She's written other things and you can certainly tell that she is a writer first and foremost. I kind of don't want to give too much away because like although it's a chunky book the world building is so detailed and intricate and purposeful. So if you like lots of world building, lots of details, lots of little bits and pieces that you just get to kind of like experience as part of this whole world, this is absolutely a book for you. It's the kind of world that you can just get lost in. Our main character's name is Pen and she is winterish. That's like her ethnicity. That's where she's from. But she's stuck in this magical kingdom of Aurelia as essentially like a glorified servant to the princess. And so while this is first and foremost a sprawling adventure fantasy kind of tale, at the heart of it is a lot of exploration about racism, discrimination, bigotry, and it's all really well done. On top of that, these friendships, this is one of my favorite kind of like friend group dynamics that we get to watch develop throughout the book. And I just... It was really good. And at the start of the book, we even get a map of the Empire of Aurelia. So, you know, that's always the best way to start a fantasy book is with a map. Definitely check it out if you're a fan of high fantasy. Then one of my favorite debuts of the last couple of years was Nura and the Immortal Palace by M.T. Khan. This is also the first book in a new series. The cover I have here is just a proof. This is the actual cover. It's so pretty. <laughs> this book is one of my favorite middle grade fantasies and it has some incredible commentary throughout. So if you like your themes strong and hard, this is definitely a book for you. At the beginning of the book, we're introduced to Nura, who is a young girl, but she's the oldest sibling of a family living in poverty. And so rather than being able to go to school, she instead has to mine mica. She sees this as a sacrifice and she hopes that she can make enough money so that her siblings will be able to eat whatever they want and go and get an education if they want to. But this mining is hugely dangerous and one day the worst happens and some kids basically get buried in this mine and Nura is really upset and tries to help rescue them and I don't want to give away too much but basically what she discovers at the bottom of this mine is like a portal into the realm of the djinn. So it's a portal fantasy with obviously very clear commentary on mica mining and like the harm that does to communities especially to children but in the djinn world we also get to see kind of class dynamics play out in a way and we also see the importance of collective work and solidarity. I loved the writing, I loved the world building, especially in that portal realm that we get transported to. It was just incredible. But I also loved how we had like a normal kid, a non-magical kid in a magical realm rather than like a chosen one kind of trope. I love me a chosen one as much as the next person, but this was just really refreshing and it just felt a little bit different. And I loved some of the themes and discussions that came up too. For me, the debut that I'm hoping to get to is Kip of the Mountain by Emma Gourlay. This is another fantasy adventure that I don't know a whole lot about the plot, but I do know that we have a cute little creature animal familiar kind of thing. Kip is desperate for a best friend. So when she rescues a tiny creature that looks like a kitten, but isn't a kitten, she names him Buffle and loves him with all her heart. But then Buffle gets kidnapped, so Kip has to go on a big, wild, sprawling adventure to rescue him. Okay, our next prompt is for an immigrant or refugee story. And again, I have three books to tell you about. I couldn't narrow it down anymore. These are all so good. First and foremost is a book that recently won the Readings Children's Prize, which I was a judge for. This is No Words by Mariam Master, and it is beautiful. Our narrator for this book is a girl named Hero. Her father loves Shakespeare and so he gave her quite a big name that she doesn't always feel like she lives up to. And while she's our narrator, really the main character of our story is a boy named Arya. He shows up at school one day and he doesn't talk. After spending some time together and becoming friends, Hero still doesn't know much about Arya or where he's from or his past or why he doesn't talk. That is until one day that she finds out that Arya, the boy who doesn't speak, has quite the way of words and he has won a poetry competition. And so through his love of language and poetry, we slowly uncover his story as a refugee from Iran. And this story is loosely based on Mariam Master's own family experience. It is pretty hard hitting. There's one chapter in particular where we learn explicitly about Arya Arya's journey from Iran to Australia and it's harrowing. But overall I would say that the tone is quite light. There's a lot of humour in here too and it's so centred in friendship and connection and love and kindness that it manages to feel very honest about Arya's lived experience while not feeling like trauma porn. It's beautiful. I love it highly recommend. Then we have one of my favorite middle grade books of all time. This is The Last Rue by Emmy Watanabe Cohen. This is a beautiful, beautiful story. It's set in the 1970s from memory and basically it's like a generation after World War II. And essentially this book is an exploration of the legacy of that war and the trauma that has resulted in Japan. And it's all kind of told through this really incredible allegory, this metaphor of dragons. Before the war, Japan used to have these big 
great dragons. After the war, they still do have dragons, but they're, they're tiny. They're tiny enough to fit in the palm of your hand. And there's one sitting on our main character's shoulder here. Kohei lives with his mother and his grandfather, and his grandfather is quite a miserable, abusive sometimes kind of man. And Kohei is just convinced that if he can only find one of Japan's big dragons again, that his grandfather will be happy. Early on in the book, we also find out that Kohei and his family are getting some new neighbors. And there's a girl his age named Zolde. This family is an American, Japanese, Jewish family and they have brought their own Jewish dragon too, who is also small, just like Kohei's dragon. And so together they go off on this little adventure to try and find the large dragons again. And so this book does get quite fantastical in a lot of ways by the end, but because it feels like it's such a strong metaphor, it just, it honestly floored me. I have not cried in a middle grade as much as I have in this one. The way that the metaphor was weaved was so intricate and intentional, but the story itself still felt so alive. And Kohei and Isolde in particular were just incredible characters to follow. In this book that is essentially about intergenerational trauma, the legacy of war, loss, grief, and also forgiveness. It's just beautiful, absolutely incredible. Another one of my favorite middle grades is A Glass House of Stars by Shirley Ma. This is an Australian book and I think it was her debut middle grade but it is loosely inspired by Shirley Ma's own experience of immigrating to Australia. In this book we're introduced to Mei Zing and her family as they first arrive here and we watch as Mei Zing struggles to kind of fit in to this whole new world, this whole new culture, language, all of it and how overwhelming and difficult that is and also we watch as her family is confronted for the first time with the racism that exists in Australian society and to top it all off a tragedy befalls this family which just makes every everything so much harder and the emotions so much bigger. And while she is really struggling with all of this herself, Maisie is just trying her best to be the good eldest daughter. There is also kind of like a magical realism, imaginative element in this story, which was just impeccable, where the house that they live kind of comes alive for Maisie, and in particular, the busted up old rundown glass house out the back, that essentially becomes this sanctuary, this oasis of magic and imagination for Maisie. So it's heartbreaking, it's tender, it's raw, it's honest, and it has, honestly, I think, I, I say this about a lot of books, I love friendships in middle grade, but I think this might have my absolute favorite friendship that I've ever read in the middle grade. Again, so honest and tender and open and generous and just big hearted, big hearted is how I want to describe this book. This is absolutely a book for the people who love When You Trap a Tiger by Tay Keller. Also, I think it's the only book on this list written in second person. Shelley Ma also has another book called All Four Quarters of the Moon, which has similar themes, but also explores some concepts around aging and our elders and memory. So I would recommend either. And if you like one, I think you like the other, but this, this probably is my favorite. For my pick for this prompt, I wanted to include a graphic novel. So I've picked Displacement by Kiku Hughes. And from what I understand, this is actually a bit of a time slip story where we're following our main character in the present day when she's on vacation and she kind of slips back into the 1940s and finds herself in a Japanese internment camp. So I'm not sure exactly what to expect. I don't know that this is like our main character herself being an immigrant, but I think it's going to be about the perception of immigrants at this time. And it's been a book that I've had on my shelf for a little while, so I'm looking forward to getting to it. And finally, our last prompt is to read a book with an animal on the cover. And the first book I want to recommend is this one. It's a beautiful cover, Mind My Stickers. It's called Evie and Rhino. And this is an historical fiction story set in Melbourne in 1891, and it's loosely based on some true events, which was when they were first setting up the Melbourne Zoo and bringing a bunch of animals in, shipping them in. Some of the ships kind of like crashed into the reef in the area. And in real life, most of those animals die. But in this story, the rhino washes up on shore and basically we watch as he makes friends with a girl named Evie. Evie has been really struggling since the death of her parents. And so this friendship basically like heals and saves both of them. It's beautiful, it's tender, it's quiet in a lot of ways, but it also is an awful lot about the humane treatment of animals and kind of like the reality of zoos, especially in this time. So if you wanna see a little girl become best friends with a rhino, like <laughs> you can't go wrong, this is really sweet. And then I have another readings prize winner. This was from the year previous, so I wasn't a judge on the panel, but it is an incredible book. It's The Sugarcane Kids and the Red Bottom Boat by Charlie Archibald. And here we got a crocodile on the cover. This is a story set in North Queensland and it has very like Enid Blyton Famous Five kind of vibes. We're following Andy and his best friend Eli when Eli's older cousin is accused of a crime he did not commit. Andy and Eli know that he didn't do this and so they kind of like get a ragtag bunch of their friends together 
to like investigate and uncover the crime and what really happened. And they end up in some very precarious situations, including down a river with a crocodile. It's a really fun contemporary adventure mystery kind of story. It's a really good time. Again, highly recommend. I recommend all of these books. That's why we're here. And so the book that I want to read with an animal on the cover is the third book in the Miss Mary Kate Martin's Guide to Monsters series. This is the Bother with the Bon Killy Knock Beast. Oh my god, I can never with these titles. But this is probably my favourite younger middle grade mystery series where we follow Mary Kate basically go off investigating unusual happenings and circumstances and she usually discovers that it's like a misunderstood monster at the heart of the mystery <laughs> and you know she seeks to understand it and to help it. I love this series and I've been meaning to get to the third book and I mean we've got a big giant, I mean I think it's the Bon Killy Knock Beast, but I mean, it looks like a giant wolf dog kind of creature, so I'm counting it. I do have a couple of other books that I really do want to try and get to in middle grade March, and they could probably fit in a handful of these prompts. We've got Countdown to Yesterday by Shirley Ma, yes, the author of The Glass House of Stars. This is her latest release, and I mean, I will just read anything she puts out at this point. I love her. And then this is another pretty new release that I would really like to get to in March. This is the new new book out by the author of The Last Quintista, which I read recently and adored. My friend at work speaks Spanish and she said that this is pronounced Alabrijes, I think. Another book that I don't really know a lot about, but after how much I loved The Last Quintista, I was going to pick up whatever came out next. So those are some of the books that I'm hoping to get to during middle grade March. And these are all the books that I have already read that fit some of the prompts that I would highly recommend to you if you're looking for some suggestions. My plan is to read some, if not all of the books that I spoke about in this video in a vlog at some point during March. So look forward to that. I hope you enjoyed my recommendations. Please let me know in the comments below what you're planning to read in middle grade March if you're participating. A big thank you as always to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon and especially big thank you to Livia, Lynette Brown and Marie. And thank you for watching. I will talk to you again soon. Until then, happy reading. Bye!